Hey, uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, my name is Daniel. I'll get the opportunity to teach God's Word today and serve here as one of the pastors. Uh, we start a brand new series today called Fire, Faith, and Flower, uh, which will take us from now until uh, Advent season or uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving um, until we start uh, our new series in uh, around Christmas time. If you want some teaching resources uh, on this, you can go to uh, jcsignup.com and just click uh, Fire, Faith, and Flower. I think it says t- series resource or something like that. Uh, or there's some printed copies as supplies last uh, out in the lobby. And and what this series is, that that may bring a question, like what is Fire, Faith, and flower. And so we're essentially doing a kind of a verse by verse study of 1 Kings 17 to 2 Kings chapter 13. Uh, but the target focus is on the life and ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And the question may come up of like, well, why these two individuals? And uh, we're not gonna give a ton of background on them because that's kind of what the whole series is about. But I wanna kind of do an introdu- introduction to First and Second Kings, and even uh, First and Second Chronicles, this portion of our scripture. And so, in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, the major focus of these two books in our Old Testament um, is the kings. Hence, the name First and Second Kings. But there's a lot of groundwork that was covered from First Kings one to chapter sixteen that we are not going to get the opportunity <clears throat> to do so. And what we need to know is that uh, the nation of Israel has had great success under primarily two kings, and that is David and Solomon, David and Solomon. But after Solomon, when his sons take power, um, they kind of ruin everything. And we have what is introduced in biblical uh, literature in this time point of the divided kingdom, the divided kingdom. And I have a map that I wanna show you about this divided kingdom here. And so you can see these two kingdoms uh, divided of the Northern kingdom, which is known as uh, the kingdom of Israel or the nation of Israel. And the primary uh, capital city in that is Samaria. And then the Southern kingdom or the kingdom of Judah uh, is is known uh, with the primary capital city being Jerusalem. And so through these bad kingships, the kingdom gets divided and you have Israel and Judah with their two capital cities. uh, And Elijah does the majority of his ministry in the Northern kingdom um, of Israel uh, with the capital city being um, Samaria. And here's what you and I need to understand about the scene that Elijah steps into. The Northern kingdom has had 19 kings over 200 years of history and not a single one of them's good. 19 kings, 200 years, not one of them's good. And so in the scholarship of uh, biblical scholarship, when they get to 1 Kings chapter 17, it's as if God shifts his attention from trying to govern through kings and says, I need prophets to speak truth to power in essence. And the king that you have that's at the end of this 200 years uh, of is the king Ahab. And this is who Elijah goes and speaks to. And Ahab is not a great king. In fact, the book of Kings calls him the worst king of all. And the worst thing that he does, the worst decision that he actually makes is in the wife that he chooses. And her name is Jezebel. If, if there's any truth that you could take away today is, uh, is that your spouse that you choose to spend the rest of your life with has major influence over you. Listen to what the author of First Kings uh, says about Ahab and Jezebel. And this is in chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. It says, Ahab, the son of Omar, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Then as it follows, the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, were not enough. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Zebal, king of the Sedemites, and he proceeded to serve Baal and bow to him in worship. So the author of 1 Kings says that the king that Elijah is about to step into the court of, because 1 Kings 17.1 introduces it like this, now Elijah. The scene that is set up is the nation state of northern, uh, the northern kingdom, the nation of Israel is governed by the worst of the worst. 
Ahab. And if that weren't enough, 1 Kings 7, 16, 31 says, and if that was enough, he went out and married uh, Jezebel, who arguably is the worship leader of the false god Baal. And Baal is the kind of the gateway uh, or Asherah and, and Baal, which we'll talk about next week, are the kind of the gateway false idols to all the other false idols. And so this is the scene that Elijah steps into. And you may feel like, how does this relate to me at all? Well, what we're going to kind of carve out here as we walk through First Kings and into Second Kings is these seasons of how the Lord uses Elijah and these lessons that we can learn from their life and ministry. Because this is how Elijah steps onto the scene. And we've simply titled this sermon, Prep Time. And so prep time, because I believe what you see in this passage in 1 Kings uh, Kings 17, 1 to 16 is three specific seasons that the Lord uses in Elijah's life to prepare him for how he desires to use him for good. And I, I believe these three seasons are seasons that all of us, the Lord desires to take us through. And they're almost a kind of a rinse and repeat of these three seasons. And so this is how it introduces 1 Kings 17, verse one. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Gilead settlers. He said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. So he walks into the king's courtyard of the most powerful individual in the land who is the worst individual who has ever served in this position. And he says, this is what, I have to say to you from the mouth, as a mouthpiece of the most high God, who's, I'm standing in his presence. Now don't read this verse and think that he is calling uh, Ahab Lord and standing in his presence. No, Elijah says, I have command from the most high God and I have to speak what he puts in my mouth and this is what he is saying. And so when he says, by my command, he's saying, by God's own words, this is what's gonna happen. And during this unit of time, why this is so um, intentional and specific of no dew or rain during these years, is that means no crops will produce. No food will be in the land, no water to drink. It will be a famine and a drought. This is what will happen, he says. And there introduce your first season or lesson when you get to verse two, because this is what the Lord immediately does with Elijah. Then he says this, verse two, then the word of the Lord came to him, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Wadi Cherith where it enters the Jordan. The first season that you're gonna see that the Lord brings Elijah to, and this we're gonna draw out first and foremost this morning is seasons of humbling, seasons of humbling. Here's the tagline or the kind of the truth that we can glean from this. Before God can work through you, often God will work in you. Before God can work through you, often God will work in you. It's in verse two. Consider this, Elijah, the great prophet who feels called for such a time as this. And many of us in different seasons of our life may feel this is exactly why God has me here at this time for this reason in this location. And he's like, this is why God has me here. I'm to go to the worst king in this whole line of kings and stand up to him and says, God's not pleased with you. You need to correct some things. And that's what he does. Maybe a little fear mixed with courage, mixed with passion, mixed with adrenaline. He leaves the temple courts of King Ahab and the next word he gets is turn, leave, hide. If I'm anything like Elijah, I'm like, God, why? Why must I run scared? What will Ahab think of me if I run scared? But this is the direct command that the Lord takes him to. And he goes, go to the Wadi Cherith. There are different translations translate this different ways. Essentially, this is a, a region in northern Israel that's hilly country. It's not a specific location geographically. It's more of a, a region of rocky, mountainous, cleft regions. And there's uh, the River Jordan kind of goes through it, but there's all these little springs and small streams that flow out in this region. He goes, go and hide there. Go and hide there. 
So he goes from the king's courts to go and hide in the rocky cliff. Turn, hide, and leave. This is the command that he goes to. And this is, I believe, what this teaches us about Elijah, of the need of humbling, but ultimately what this teaches most about God. In God's character, I believe it teaches us about who he is and what he has the potential to do. Because this teaches us that God has the ability and he is able to provide for us even in the most difficult spaces and places in our lives. That God has the ability to reach us and teach us deep truths about his character and his ability. And these seasons of humbling are not designed to teach you and I that we have what it takes to get it through, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and move onward. But rather, these seasons of bringing us low to the ground from the king's courts to go and hide in the rocks are designed to teach us our deep need for a savior of one we can trust in, in season and out of season, to be brought close to the good shepherd's heart. I leeried in actually putting this next quote in there of what A.W. Tozer teaches us about God's using of an individual of for his good and his own glory. But A.W. Tozer, American theologian, writes this, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. This most often, of this humbling, is not a thing that happens in public eye, but rather in the private solitude of time before God. You could say it like this, that before God uses us publicly, he usually will humble us privately. Before God desires to use one publicly, he often will humble him privately. And too often, times of us being used by God in our lives or whatever vocation or season that you find yourself in, too often we are too impressed with ourselves. We are often way too impressed with ourselves and not enough impressed with the character and ability of God. Because look at how God uses this humbling experience of Elijah to teach him about what he can do. Listen to verse four. You are to drink from the wadi. I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. He proceeded to do what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived in the wadi Cherith where it enters the Jordan. The ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, and he would drink from the wadi. The first thing that it teaches us about who God is is he really likes meat. Any vegetarians out there? Just joke, total joke, total joke, okay? But... Inside of this is the question that you may help us teach this principle and this point is how long do we believe that Elijah is actually in this location? And most individuals will say somewhere around three years. I don't know if you've ever waited for anything before, but I get a little frustrated when the coffee line takes more than 15 minutes in the morning. I get a little frustrated when a a season in my life lasts longer than a week or two. But if Elijah has to spend any length of time of months or even years sitting beside a brook, imagine the scene in your mind, being fed by birds and drinking from a stream. The Lord says, he says, I have commanded the ravens to provide for you. Your second season is the season of dependence. The point could be illustrated this way. Your waiting seasons will often develop your dependence on God's provision. Dependence on God's provision. Look at verse four, if you have it in front of you of God's word, or you can see it on the the sky Bible back there. Verse four, it says, you are to drink from the wadi, Okay, a river to provide water, that's good. But here's the line that jumped out at me. I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. Our God is a way-making God. He desires to teach us how to walk with him in season and out of season. What does that even mean, that old Christian saying, in season and out of season? In seasons when you're like, you're feeling it. It's good to walk with Jesus. We're singing with a, 
a, a pep in our step and it, the sun shining on our face and it's wonderful to be alive out of season. I don't know what your out of season looks like, but you know what it is. But the key character trait of who God is in this season is provider. Does your life illustrate it? A dependence on God's provision, how you use your time, your effort, your finances, your relationships, etc. Does it illustrate your dependence on God in your life as he is your provider? Does that show your dependence on God in your life? Because for most of our lives, we kind of try to position ourselves to be independent. That's the goal of how we teach our kids to be raised, to be independent. But the reality for all of us is, is if dependence is the goal, then weakness is strength. Let that just sit there on, on your ears for a second, because that kind of went against your own heart posture. It went against mine as this text is teaching to us. Because if Elijah isn't even supposed to hunt or gather food, he's supposed to sit there and trust in the provision of a bird to show up in the morning and the evening. God is trying to illustrate something that he will later bring out in his life of saying, I need you to grow in your dependence here if I'm ever gonna take you there. Because if you can't trust me in this, you'll never be able to trust me in that. And many of us spend our lives going in circles of a cycle of immaturity in our faith because we've never learned to trust God with simple provision. Because if dependence is the goal in this Christian life of trusting God as Father, then weakness is a strength. I didn't say ignorance is strength. I didn't say a lack of wisdom is strength. Don't let me mix my words here in this. I said, if dependence is the goal, then weakness is strength. To say that I have a lack within me and it's not down in there to muster it up, to take hold of today by the horns like a Peloton and saying, you got it down in there. Just try harder, do better. You'll reach the finish line. If that's not the goal, if dependence is the goal, then weakness is a strength to say, I need you, Lord. I've got to walk with you. I've got to trust you. I need to wake up in the morning and open this word to get to you because I need you. I crave you. I need the spirit governing over my life because it is wisdom. That noticing my weak spots is strength because I know where I have need to trust him more. I need where I need his strength in my life. If dependence is the goal, then weakness is a strength. Because a season of humbling to be brought low, to teach us about the character and the nature of who our God is, of he is provider. And Elijah, I need you to understand that you need to depend on me. So I'm gonna bring you low out of the king's court to the sit beside a brook to wait on some birds. Then if that's what it's gonna take, I'll do it. And if I'm gonna teach you to be humble and then I'm gonna teach you to depend on me and remember how 1 Kings progresses. It says after a while, the wadi dried up, verse seven, because there had been no rain in the land, just like Elijah said. If I'm Elijah and I'm an outdoorsman of any kind, I'm like, well, how long is this water gonna last? Because I just said it ain't gonna rain. And if I'm making a, a mark on a rock, a big rock on the side, if, if, if you're anything like you've seen any of those survival shows, okay, it's some of my favorite favorites to watch uh, every day. And so, um, but like, I'm keeping up with the day. Okay, the sun came up, tick, you know, wait till it does it again, tick. Like, all right, I know how many days it's been, this small stream, it's gonna dry up. Hey, I said it wasn't gonna rain. It hasn't rained. I'm trusting in the Lord. What's happening next? Then the word of the Lord came to him again. Verse eight, verse nine, get up and go to Zarephath. All right, sounds good, Lord. Where are we headed? That belongs to Siddim and stay there. Look, I've commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. Now let's think about this for a moment. There's been a famine in the land because there's been no rain or no dew. 
If there's been a famine in the land with no rain or no dew, who runs out of food first? Those who have a lack, those who have a need. Who has a lack or a need more than widows? You see how this point has continued to be illustrated to Elijah. Hey, trust in me with a simple provision of a bird. Now I need you to go and ask for food from a widow. Somebody who probably ran out of food first in the entire city. I need you to go and ask, go ask her for a meal. And it's as if Elijah got the point. Because look at verse 10. So Elijah got up and went. A season of humbling and a season of dependence led him into what I would argue, don't put it up there yet, but a season of obedience. Because look at what, how the verse continues. So Elijah got up and he went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. Elijah called to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup and let me drink. Season of humbling and a season of dependence will lead us to radical obedience that may not make sense. That may not make sense. You see, all the Lord's work in these cycles, and you could probably spot them over your life if you, if you could, uh, with wisdom, look backwards over your life of how the Lord has worked and taught you in different seasons. You could probably point out a season of humbling, a season of dependence, and a season of obedience. And then almost it's as if the cycle starts all over again. Because the point of the gospel, the point of the cross is these three seasons put on repeat. Christ was humbled. He depended on the Father and then he went to radical obedience to go to the cross. To come to Jesus, we need to be humbled with a faith like a child to come to him in dependence and trust him and then obey to turn from our sins and trust in him. These three seasons will be put on display over and over and over again in your life and mine if we would simply allow the Lord to lead and guide us. But here's the beautiful thing. The beautiful thing is this cycle as we are broken in this life from sin of living it, the Lord's work is always moving us towards restoration and to be restored. It made me think of this picture that I saw uh, on the internet, if you can throw that up there, the next slide, of this. And some of you may know what this is. It's actually a style of uh, art, but that's simply just a, a plate that was been patched back together. On this side, my right, most of your lefts, is what's called is kizuksi. I think I'm saying that correctly. This is a type of art of broken pottery that the pottery is broken either intentionally or accidentally and then reforged together with gold and then sealed once it's finished and most likely placed on a shelf or in a museum for all to look at and marvel because the, the beautiful part is, is that the cheap or somewhat fragile pottery has been reforged together back with uh, most, most times 14 karat gold and now is more valuable than it was before. And then the picture on my left, most of your right, is a picture of a plate that's been put back together and fully restored for a proper use. Either one of these, whichever one you relate to more inside of this, is the Lord works in our lives in these ways. Of this season of humbling, this season of dependence. I don't know what season of life you are in in this said moment, but all of them are working in such a way to bring you to a place of restoration, to be used for God's glory, to be more valuable than you were before on your own without him, to be more useful than you were without him. You see, in the life of Elijah, he was humbled privately before God before he would ever be used publicly. You see, the beautiful part of 1 Kings chapter 17 is verse one is the only time Elijah is in the public eye. And then God immediately is like, all right, Elijah, I need to teach you some things first. 
Uh, You said what I needed you to say. Now let's go and start this process because I need to forge within you deeply this humbling and dependence on me so that you can go and do the next task. Because the next task was the next week is you got to face off with 400 prophets who none of them want to see you live. God humbled him privately before God would ever use him publicly. Elijah is brought to this place of dependence, which will lead him to a place of radical obedience. The obedience is simple as ask a widow for a cup to get a drink, which sounds like the most ridiculous thing ever. In their ears, there's been a famine, there's been a drought. Why would I ask her or, or, or take from her in this? But he does it. Verse 13. Then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said. First, make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterward, you may make for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord your God of Israel has said. The flour jar will not become empty. And the oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. You see this widow in the few verses that we jumped over is terrified with one cup of flour, enough to make a simple loaf of bread for her and her son to eat it and then die, she says. She says, hey, I don't have anything to break uh, to, to bring this out, verse 12. I don't have anything to bake. I just got this handful of flour and a, jar, a bit of oil and I'm gonna gather a couple of sticks. I'm gonna go prepare this to die. That's where Elijah finds her in this moment gathering sticks to build a fire, to bake a loaf of bread, to eat their last meal, and then die from starvation. Elijah says, whoa, 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 don't be afraid. I can only imagine the story that he could tell her while that fire's cooking and the bread's baking of encouragement, of trusting the Lord from sitting beside a little stream, trusting a bird to bring him some food. I can only imagine the encouragement that Elijah could bring about a season that he just sat in and then walked to, hey, the Lord told me to come to you for a purpose. You ain't gonna die. I've got trust in the most high God who controls the rain clouds and every uh, source of revenue of anything. You ain't gonna die in this moment. He actually brought me to you to ask you for a cup of water and a piece of bread to eat. It's not going to run out. If you would just simply trust. And what you see Elijah being used in the life of this widow who has been humbled, but she lacks dependence and therefore her obedience is short-sighted is he continues on. And there's even more in this story that we're going to cover in two weeks, but I don't have time to actually draw out. But you see, this season of your walk with Jesus has the potential for massive impact, not only in this season of your life, but the next and the next and the next. So what season are you in? Because the story of for the widow and Elijah is the, the flower jar and the oil jar. They didn't run out. Because of Elijah's great humbling experience of learning to see himself rightly in light of who God was and learning to see God rightly. His season of dependence, of trusting in the Lord as great provider. If dependence is the goal, then weakness is the strength. For you and your life, what season are you in? I don't know if you feel like you're being humbled in this moment, but just trust that humbling. If you trust the process that God desires to use it greatly down the road in your life. I don't know if you're being in a season of dependence. We're all in some version of humbling or dependence or obedience, whatever it is. Of learning to trust in the Lord in in season and out of season. It may be in your relationships. It may be in the things that you define that you need or want. It may be in your future. I don't know what's next. It may be in your finances of learning to trust God in that season. But these seasons of humbling and dependence often lead us to radical obedience that sometimes does not make sense. Now, it doesn't always not make sense. That's why I just said sometimes it doesn't make sense. Often it doesn't make sense to our own ears because that's true in Elijah. 
You see, for Elijah, he was led to go ask a widow for a cup and a bread to eat. That didn't make any sense. But one of my favorite verses in this is verse 10, where it starts out from the jump. So he went. Could that kind of obedience be spoken true of me or you? Of a next step in the Lord, of trusting him, that you've walked through this process maybe one time, maybe for some of you who are more seasoned in life, maybe it feels like hundreds of times that the Lord keeps teaching you how to be humbled, how to be dependent on him and how to ultimately be obedient unto him. You see, God's redemption of us is always purposeful. God's redemption of us is always purposeful, even if right now it doesn't feel like it. So I don't know what season you're in in life right now, one of these three of humbling, dependence, or obedience, but would you trust God with the process? Would you, I want to simply invite you to get to a prayer posture that you feel comfortable with. Some of you, it may be just continue looking at me. Others, it could be just bowing your head and closing your eyes. Maybe interlocking your hands like you're in a prayer posture, whatever it is that you feel comfortable with. And I just want to simply walk through these three seasons and giving you one prayer prompt for each one of them. Then I'm going to pray and we're going to stand and sing. If you're in a season of humbling right now, Would you simply pray to the Most High God this simple prayer? Teach me to see you rightly. Because the goal of humbling is learning to see ourselves in light of Him. To see Him for more glorious and beautiful as He is. For dependence. But you simply, I would invite you to pray this simple prayer. Show me how my weakness is strength. Lord, would you show me how my weakness is strength? For obedience. This is most likely the one that is most easily divided and the available to be applied because each one of us may have a different thing that the Lord is asking us to do next. For some of you who are, who have never prayed to receive Christ and put your faith and trust in him, maybe for you, today's the day. You don't need to wait another moment after I say a prayer and say, amen. There'll be some elders and their spouses and prayer team members down front that would love to pray with you and for you. Help walk you to meet Jesus. They aren't Jesus, but they can introduce you to him. For others of you, maybe it's going public with your faith in in baptism. It's time to stop waiting around or waiting for the right moment or the right day. It's just today, I'm like, hey, I'm going to take a next step. I'm going to have a meeting and get it scheduled. Go public with my faith. For some others of you, maybe it's something outside the walls of this church building. Maybe there's a level of obedience that you're being asked to do in your family or at your job or to meet the needs of a neighbor. And God's put you on my heart. I just just want to ask, can I help in this way? Whatever it may be, would your humbling lead you to dependence? Would your dependence lead you to obedience? Because God's redemptions of us is always purposeful. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your great humbling, your dependence, and your obedience. May it be a model to us in our faith as we follow you. Would you teach us to be humbled and walk with you privately? That private walking of humbling lead us to dependence upon you for our every breath, our every need. Our weakness is strength when we have it in dependence on you. And God, whatever the obedience is that you're asking us to take a next step in, may we not delay another moment, but do it now. Jesus, in your precious name, we pray all these things. Amen. Hey, would you stand and worship with us? There'll be some elders, uh, prayer team members, and others down front that would love to receive you. If you have uh, 
a prayer concern that we can pray over or a next step in your faith. Let's sing together.